is a special moment. And we're very lucky to have Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman as our keynotes. They have not done this in two years, so we are unbelievably lucky to be here with them to hear them speak today. So many of us admire them and are inspired by them. And uh, I will give you a formal introduction of them, but it's just thrilling to have them with us today. So in their lecture, Unwalling Citizenship, uh, Teddy and Fauna will discuss their work on citizenship culture at the United States-Mexico border and the network of spaces they have co-developed with border communities to cultivate regional and global solidarities. Teddy Cruz is a professor of public culture and urbanism, visual arts department, and the director of urban research, USCD, Center on Global Justice at UCSD. Teddy is recognized internationally for his urban and architectural research, the Tijuana-San Diego border, advancing border immigrant neighborhoods as sites of cultural production from which to rethink urban policy, affordable housing, and civic infrastructure. Fauna is an associate professor of political science and founding director of the Center on Global Justice at the University of California, San Diego. Fauna's research engages the intersection of ethics, public culture, urban policy, and the city with a special focus on climate justice, border, border ethics, and equitable urbanization. Estudio Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman is a research-based political and architectural practice based in San Diego. Teddy and Fauna also direct the Political Equator meetings, an ongoing series of nomadic urban actions and debates involving the public and communities oscillating across contested jurisdictions, sites, and stations across the border region. Their investigation of this contested, of this geography of conflict have inspired a practice and pedagogy that emerges from the particularities of this bicultural territory and the integration of theoretical research pedagogy and design production. Please help me in welcoming Teddy and Fauna. Thank you so much, Brian, um, for that really generous introduction. And thanks to Lisa and Sergio and everybody who had a hand in planning this event and the exhibition and including us within it. Thank you so much, truly. So um, it is our first in-person talk of any kind in over two years. So we're really, we're delighted to be here to sort of open up once again. <laughs> um, we're, we're very excited to share our urban uh, research-based practice at the San Diego Tijuana uh, border. We really see this zone as a microcosm of all of the injustices and indignities faced by vulnerable people across the globe. Political violence, climate disruption, accelerating migration, rising nationalism, border building everywhere, deepening inequality, and the steady decay of public thinking. We live and work a few miles from the child detention centers that will forever stain this period of American history. San Diego Tijuana has become a lightning rod of American nativism. And although the news cameras are gone, Tens of thousands of Central American and Haitian migrants wait at the wall for asylum that never comes, reviled by the Mexican public as a nuisance, an infestation, or else they sit in US detention centers as tools of deterrence, until recently separated forcibly from their children and exposed to a raging pandemic. It's been particularly devastating in recent years to witness the emotional impact on children, their fear and the inevitable psychic internalization of being socially and morally marginalized. Hopefully there's relief on the horizon. It really remains to be seen, right? But the prospect of more border porosity in the coming period is drawing even more people north and climate change will inevitably accelerate these flows. A recent United Nations survey found that 72% of arriving migrants at our Southern border are agricultural workers and identified agricultural instability as a major factor in their decision to walk North. So 
needless to say, global injustice is an intensely local dynamic uh, where we live and work. Now, against these local atrocities, border communities and activists on both sides of the border continue to confront and productively circumvent unjust power. Some of this contestation is about sanctuary and protecting people targeted by the state. Some of it is working through the courts, the detention centers and other institutions of power to advocate for people who are already ensnared in the net of political violence. Some of it takes the shape of bottom-up civic agency that exposes and counters unjust power and confronts hateful political narratives and transgresses boundaries. And much of it arrives informally through everyday collective practices of adaptation and resilience in conditions of scarcity and danger. Over the years, Teddy and I have accompanied some of these bottom-up emancipatory transgressions and eruptions of democratic will in close partnership with agencies at the front lines. In recent years, these struggles have also attracted artists and cultural producers from around the world who want to engage in acts of performative protest. But we have been somewhat critical of this sort of uptick in ephemeral cultural action that dips in and out of the conflict. These, you know, they can be creative, but they tend to be extractive in their processes and their impacts on public consciousness are as fleeting as the Instagram posts that they generate. You know, what happens the day after the happening? So we've, you know, over the years been advocating for a longer view of resistance in this region, a more systemic approach to the drivers of injustice and more strategic thinking about cultural, institutional, and spatial transformation in the border region. And these commitments have culminated in a project that we'd like to share with you, the UCSD, our university, the UCSD Community Stations, a network of public spaces located in vulnerable neighborhoods across the border region where universities and communities meet to share knowledges and resources and collaborate on research, dialogue, cultural and educational activities and urban design build projects in the city. The community stations are sort of the field-based social engagement arm of our research-based practice, which is housed inside uh, the university. So here we are, um, our team with some of our community partners in Tijuana just before COVID-19 hit. We have several core commitments that comprise a community stations model, which we think is highly replicable um, for universities everywhere. So I'll introduce these commitments. Teddy will then take you on a tour of the four community station sites. And then I will con conclude with a few words about our programming at these sites and how they link our local border conditions with sites of conflict across the country and across, across the world. So to begin, we localize the global. We've always resisted the idea that justice is something that happens out there in the world somewhere, right? Living and working where we do, we don't need to send our students far away to learn about territorial conflict, migration, poverty, climate justice, it's all right there. We're minutes away from an international border and crisis, and this enables an amazing proximity between campus and field, between theory and practice. Of course, going local here means recognizing ourselves as a region, a site of interdependence. Despite the wall and ugly political rhetoric that's designed to divide us, we are a binational ecology of flows and circulation and our future is intertwined. Air, water, waste, health, money, culture, love, hope, all of these things don't stop at walls. We build trust bridges, long-term partnerships between our university and border communities. We're not like, and we see them as sort of flaky university programs that come and go, diagnosing crises, extracting information, and then disappearing. We don't disappear. We're there for the long haul. Relatedly, 
we decolonize knowledge. It's a beautiful idea. We're keenly attuned to power dynamics when universities arrive in communities and have become critical of both extractive research methods and humanitarian problem solving missions. We don't do applied research and we don't do charity. We're not a service learning program in sort of conventional academic language. Academic culture is filled with vertical assumptions that we know more, that we are trained to solve the world's problems if only they would listen to us. Um, we're committed to horizontal practices of co-production, engaging communities as partners with knowledges and agency. Everybody contributes, everybody learns, and we do things together in the border region that none of us could have done alone. Along these lines, universities really too often take for granted the resources that communities invest when they partner with us, time, space, social capital, labor, and knowledge. As a matter of epistemic justice and labor equity, we've demanded that our university recognize and compensate these contributions. We curate two-way flows inside out and outside in, unsiloing the campus and inviting activists and community leaders into the campus to teach with us. So we're ultimately thinking outside the box, literally, of what it means for a university to commit to diversity and equity. Cultivating skills of cultural sensitivity, empathy, and awesome respect, we've argued that these are skills that are best learned in C2. Today's challenges demand intersectionality. It's the buzz, you know, the academic buzzword of the day. Um, but everything we do on migration, climate change, environment, health, labor, education, urbanization is refracted through a shared lens of social transformation. And in this sense, everything we do is cultural. For us, ultimately, it's about changing hearts and minds, tackling inequality by increasing public knowledge about the roots and springs of injustice and growing connected, civically engaged border communities capable of collective action, advocacy, and productive contestation. Ultimately, we're committed to building what we call a cross-border citizenship culture, a sense of belonging that is not defined by the documents you carry in your pocket, but by the shared interests and aspirations of people who inhabit a violently disrupted civic space. Those who benefit from narratives of separation and mistrust prefer that we remain fragmented, a fragmented public, that the idea of citizenship divides us rather than unites us. But we're seeking to inspire more inclusive imaginaries of coexistence and cross-border citizenship in this contested territory. Our cultural aspirations, are inspired by a 20th century lineage of Latin American civic uh, experimentation, Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal, in contexts of unimaginable violence and social fragmentation, cities like Porto Alegre, Brazil, and Bogota and Medellin, Colombia, sought to heal the wounds of history and mobilize a cohesive civic identity through participatory cultural action. The way Antanas Mokus in Bogota, for example, used street mimes, urban games, and theatrics, you know, theatrical public disruptions to, dis, you know, to transform urban norms from the bottom up, or the way Medellin transformed urban remainders and forgotten zones into vibrant civic spaces that prioritized access and education. Like Medellin's now legendary library parks, our UCSD community stations represent a model of urban co-development between the university and community organizations. Each station is designed, funded, built, programmed, and maintained collaboratively between the campus and the community. And in this sense, through this work, ultimately, we are rejecting conventional strategies of urban beautification and innovation that turn our public spaces into sites of leisure and consumption. We question the agendas of the creative class and their pop-ups. 
which too often accelerate gentrification, appropriate arts and culture for private ends, and become an apology for the absence of more substantial public investment in the city. We believe public, public space must become civicized. It's a beautiful word uh, used by James Tully in his work, a site of dialogue and contestation and infused with resources and tools to increase public knowledge and community capacity all around. So now a tour of the four UCSD community stations and just a hint about what goes on inside of them. So uh, for us, urban justice is a distributive concept requiring not only the redistribution of resources, but also the redistribution of knowledges. We designed this reciprocal knowledge infrastructure as both a collaborative education platform, but also a model of shared urban intervention. We in fact discovered and later claimed that the economic and programmatic power of our public university could be leveraged for communities to develop their own public spaces and social housing. So as, as a distributed system of public spaces transgressing the wall, the community stations specialize social justice, mobilizing cross-border citizenship through cultural action. With our community partners, we have co-developed four community stations, two in San Diego, two in Tijuana. We will take you from North to South. The UCSD Earth Lab community station is in partnership with Grand Works San Diego, an environmental justice nonprofit located in the low income primarily Black and Latinx neighborhood of Encanto, a community characterized, characterized by high un unemployment, low educational attainment, food insecurity, and cyclical poverty. The station occupies a four acre vacant parcel owned by the San Diego Unified School District who granted the parcel to our partnership to increase educational capacity for the eight public schools within walking distance of the site. The goal was to promote circulations between traditional classroom-based learning and outdoor experiential learning. This access to municipal land actually gave us the leverage and the inspiration and the motivation to assemble a unique cross-sector collaboration between a major research university, a local school district, and a grassroots organization to co-develop public space, placing education at the center of community development. Before COVID-19 hit, 3,000 kids and their family circulated through the Earth Lab each year. And during the current transition, it continues to operate as an outdoor socially distanced classroom. Recently, the school district committed, com committed capital monies towards a more defined, refined physical resolution of the site for what has been so far a largely informal effort. While UCSD, our university, will invest in sustainable educational programming, research and management in collaboration with our grassroots partners, Grandworks San Diego, who will steward community participation. Pedagogic zones at the site will be focused on habitat restoration through energy, water, food, and community programs, all wrapped by indigenous Kumeyaay knowledges and environmental practices. Ultimately, the UCSD Earth Lab Community Station will perform as an open air climate action park designed for edu uh, environmental education and climate justice. The school district has also committed school bond funding recently for a new climate action uh, design uh, lab to anchor the site and as a pilot for post COVID porosity in class classroom design. This station will break ground in 2023. Moving south, the UCSD CASA Community Station is in partnership with the nonprofit CASA Familiar, a 30 year old community based social service organization. It is located in the border neighborhood of San Isidro, a site, the site of the busiest land crossing in the Western Hemisphere. The community is 90% Latinx and has one of the highest unemployment rates, lowest uh, median household income and worst air quality in the San Diego uh, County region. The heart of this community station is a beloved historic church that sat for decades in disrepair and which we were able to rescue through this project with our partners during, with our partners. during construction. The building had to be lifted for installing new foundations. 
During the times of so much political violence inflicted on this border community, the surreal image of the church levitating with Tijuana's informal settlements in the distance inspired a sense of hope for the local residents. With the adaptive reuse of this historic church uh, as a catalyst, we designed the UCSD Casa Community Station as a double project. A parcel size social infrastructure made of spaces for cultural and economic activity is flanked by affordable housing. The organizational design of the parcel through a system of linear stripes with a variety of small scale buildings performing different roles was also a deliberate strategy to mobilize diverse financial streams to fund the different building typologies. Leveraging programmatic investments by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to support the educational, cultural, and research programming between the university and the community, Casa Familiar and UCSD secured capital investments by the Park Foundation and Art Place America to build the social service infrastructure. These investments enabled our community uh, partners to qualify for a $9 million new market tax credits development package facilitated by the local municipality. Casa Familiar has become effectively a developer of alternative of affordable housing for its own community of San Isidro and public space was uh, truly the detonator. We renovated the historic church into a community theater with an outdoor stage. And this performance space is flanked on one side by a series of small accessory buildings for Casa Familiar social programming and on the other side by an open air civic pavilion. This, this social, educational and cultural infrastructure anchors 10 units of affordable housing at both ends of the parcel, all mediated by pedestrian walkways. Ultimately, the project advances a reproducible, a reproducible prototype for a small scale, small scale development in low income neighborhoods where buildings collaborate to transform small lots into social housing infrastructures. We completed construction of this station in February, just before COVID-19 hit. It's been really sad to, you know, we, this project has taken so long to build just before COVID-19 hit. And so it has taken us a while to program it, uh, a, a, which we are beginning to finally do a, in collaboration with our partners. Afford what is important to say here is that affordable housing takes on a different meaning when it is deliberately threaded into spaces for social programming, summoning residents to participate in the development of local economy and cultural production, synergizing spaces, programs, resources, and people. This is an integrated social spatial system that is programmed and co-curated between university and community. So let's imagine a small coalition of local artists, promotoras, and neighborhood youth collaborating with university curators, theater script writers, and visual artists who come together periodically to co-produce a play that explores an urgent issue facing the community and then enacted by local youth in the community theater. These artistic productions are rooted in neighborhood stories and become bottom-up evidentiary material to increase not only public knowledge, but also the processes for policy transformation. Before moving across the border, allow me to show the two stations in Tijuana, allow us to pause for a moment and summarize a couple of concepts to share how these processes behind our two San Diego based stations exemplify several commitments or building blocks as we call them in our own practice. First, in conditions of poverty, housing needs to be embedded in an infrastructure of social, economic and cultural support. In other words, we must rethink affordable housing from autonomous units into relational social systems. Housing must be public infrastructure. Density should not be measured as an abstract number of objects or people per area. Density must be understood instead as the intensity of social and economic exchanges per area. Migrant neighborhoods have taught us that these exchanges mobilized by bottom-up urbanization is the DNA for democratizing the city into more inclusive and plural environments. Zoning must stop being punitive, preventing socialization. 
Instead, it should be conceptualized as a gener generative tool that anticipates, stimulates, and organizes social and economic activity in neighborhoods. The developer's pro forma, the business plan of the developer, is architecture's financial plastic. Inside the mathematics of this spreadsheet, our services as architects amount to 15% of, of a project's construction costs. This undercapitalized asset can be mobilized as collateral for development. Nothing should prevent us architects from becoming developers of our own projects and by association, nothing should prevent communities from doing the same. In other words, the sweat equity of architects, cultural producers and community leaders, the economic equity of public universities and Municipal, municipal protocols for accessing public parcels, all of that can be bundled, aggregated to enable communities to develop their own neighborhood. That truly has been our, our story. So moving now across the border, our two community stations in Tijuana are located in the Laureles Canyon, an informal settlement adjacent to the border wall. I will take a, a couple of moments to describe this incredible context, truly the, the laboratory of our practice. This location is at an important juncture of conflict. Here, the topography of Tijuana's canyons clash with the border wall before spilling northbound into an environmentally protected estuary in San Diego, which is now layered with security infrastructure. At this hotspot, the conflict between natural and jurisdictional systems, between ecological and political priorities is profound. And as we zoom in further, we witness the collision between the estuary and the US, the border wall, and the informality of the Laureles Canyon in Tijuana, which is home to 100,000 people. This aerial video shows Laureles Canyon and the precarious condition of the informal settlement that has sprawled on its slopes. The site sits 30 minutes away from our campus in San Diego and demonstrates the dramatic proximity of wealth and extreme poverty in our region. Laureles Canyon is impacted by dump sites, drastic erosion, flooding, and landslides. And all of this is exacerbated by uh, the dramatic precipitation fluctuations of climate change. Because Laureles Canyon lacks water and waste management infrastructure to mitigate these impacts, much of the trash, along with tons of sediment, flows upstream, downstream in this case, ending in the estuary in San Diego contaminating this bioregional and shared by national asset, truly the, the lungs of our bioregion. In other words, here, the border wall is an artifact of environmental insecurity. These impacts have intensified in recent years because of a profound lack of collaboration between San Diego and Tijuana to manage these cross-border flows. In the last decades, 70% of the open lands in Laureles Canyon has, have been lost to irregular urban growth. We have been identifying and bundling on squatted lands in the settlement that are still environmentally rescuable to shape what we are calling an archipelago of conservation. We are advancing an ambitious regional project called the Cross-Border Commons, an environmental conservation initiative that links the estuary in the US with the informal settlement in Mexico, forming a continuous social and ecological envelope that transgresses the wall and protects the environmental systems shared between the two border cities. With our Tijuana-based activist partners, we are curating a coalition of state and municipal agencies, grassroots organizations and universities, universities on both sides of the wall. And we are now negotiating with the municipality in Tijuana to gain access to the remaining public lands inside the informal settlement. Another important contextual note before I introduce you to the Tijuana stations is that Laureles Canyon has also been the site where we have advanced our research on informal urbanization. As we have written about over many years, the informal settlements of Tijuana are built with the waste of San Diego, recycling architectural parts to construct habitation and infrastructure, one city building itself with the waste of the other. We have learned great a deal from these increment, incremental building practices as people construct their own shelter in layers over time. 
In a case study uh, that we documented, a metal frame appeared one day, uh, from one day to another. In, in a couple of months, uh, recycled materials began to thread the spaces, and in the next weeks, an informal house emerged. We have also taken note that multinational maquiladoras or factories surrounding these informal settlements typically benefit from easy access to cheap labor. Over the years, uh, we have also been experimenting with factory-made material systems to structurally mediate the recycling of waste. Because Tijuana is a city of multinational factories that prey on cheap labor, we have proposed an ethical loop where factories invest, must invest in emergency housing. So here we are inside Mecalux, a Spanish maquiladora that produces lightweight metal shelving systems for global export, adapting its prefabricated materials into structural scaffolds as armatures for informal housing. We design a catalog with the factory's engineers to test a variety of prototypes and configurations. The first Mecalux typology is shown here with an ad adapted recycled urban waste from San Diego, illustrating how top-down institutional resources must support the bottom-up creative intelligence of informal urbanization. A couple of years ago, we built the first example, being inside the factory, redirect, redirecting its material systems and surplus value to sites of emergency was an important milestone in our research-based practice. We then worked with our partners to build uh, early applications to demonstrate to the community the adaptability of the system, such as this small uh, bus stop to shelter Laurel's workers from the sun. It was important uh, to introduce you briefly to these contextual processes because our two community stations in Tijuana operate within this rich Ecolo ecology of social, environmental, economic, and material relations and partners. Now to the stations themselves. The UCSD Alacran Community Station is located in the most rugged, precarious, and polluted south basin of the canyon. It is a partnership with Embajadores de Jesus, a religious organization led by activist pastor Gustavo Banda and uh, activist pastor uh, psychologist Zaida Guillen. Uh, with limited resources, embajadores began construction of a refugee camp to provide shelter, food, and basic services to hundreds of, hundreds of Haitian and Central American refugees while they navigate unjust asylum processes in the US and Mexico. And with the help of skilled migrants, they began building their own emergency housing. We have now established a long-term partnership to co-develop a community station here to increase refugee housing capacity. We are accelerating the production of Mecalux frames to install them over uh, vernacular post and beam concrete systems into housing infrastructures. The housing scaffolds will, will be built first, leaving the interiors as planned open systems equipped with utilities to support incremental live work configurations. These envelopes are the seeds for an evolving sanctuary neighborhood to be infilled through time by the migrant residents themselves. We see migrant housing as a mechanism for generating jobs. To sustain the construction process over time, we are designing a sanctuary economy we embed refugee housing in spaces of fabrication, training, small-scale economic development. With the support of the Park Foundation, we have assembled a community-owned business, the Little Haiti Construction Company, with a two library, wood and metal machines, and a couple of, tra uh, of trucks and tractors. The immigrant community will complete the construction of this, of this site and remain operational for future construction jobs across the canyon. The UCSD Alacran Community Station began construction last summer with seed capital provided by New York-based philanthropist Robert Rubin and Samuel and Stefan Samuel, whose collaboration on this project expands their commitment to the prefabricated social housing logics of post-war French architect Jean Prouvé. And finally, our UCSD Divina Community Station. This station is a partnership with Colonos de la Divina Providencia, a Tijuana NGO that is rooted in the community of Divina. 
The nonprofit facilitates a variety of social services, including meals for youth, senior services, medical assistance, and environmental awareness. Using the Mechalux parts, uh, the station takes the shape of a, flex a flexible scaffold to accommodate a variety of informal programs, including flea markets, cultural events, and a series of multi-level spaces to accommodate a small high school, all curated between our university and our partners. At the Divina Station, we work with community leaders, students, and researchers on social protection from landslides, floods, and the estuary health beyond the wall. We lead educational programming through which young people understand zones of vulnerability in their own neighborhoods, emphasizing ecological conservation of species and habitat restoration. It's never too early to begin. We have committed to elevating children here as the cross-border citizens of the future. Our two Tijuana stations have also advanced important building blocks in our research practice. Just sharing two of them. The informal for us is not just an aesthetic category, but is in fact a praxis, a dynamic set of functional urban operations from below that counter and transgress the imposition of top-down political power and exclusionary economic models. Hospitality is the first gesture when the immigrant arrives. We all know that an essential charitable opening, a first step in creating a more welcoming society. But as needs become more complex over time, charity is not the appropriate model for building an inclusive society. We need to move from hospitality to inclusion. Thinking beyond shelter for us is a foundation for rethinking refugee camps everywhere from places of short-term habitation and service provision to durable infrastructures for inclusion. Migrant shelters can be agile for negotiating both transition and rootedness, the ephemeral and the permanent. <clears throat> so these are the four UCSD community stations. There's so much more to say about them, uh, about our amazing partners and what we do together in these spaces. While all the stations you know, focus on different issues that reflect the priorities of each of these neighborhoods, um, they all are richly curated for dialogue, collaborative research, urban pedagogy, participatory design build and cultural production. They all aspire to increasing public knowledge, challenging divisive political narratives and advancing strategies together to counter exploitation, dispossession, deportation and environmental calamity. Now these activities often invite encounters with formal institutions of power that govern the border zone. Sometimes these meetings you know, produce mutual recognition and cooperation, and sometimes quite distinctively, they don't. For us, the goal is less about resolving conflict than about understanding it and democratizing it. We see the you know, democracy in the border zone as a fundamentally bottom-up process of exposing and rendering more widely accessible the complex histories and mechanisms of injustice that are too often hidden within official accounts of who we are as a region. Racist political narratives in the United States portray the border zone as a site of rupture and criminality, but we've been committed to generating very different stories, um, counter narratives about life in this region that are grounded in the experiences and voices of those who inhabit it. We are a region of flows and circulation, shared practices and aspirations, alliances of hearts and minds, regardless of the wall that too often restricts the movement of our bodies. In this sense, the community stations really become a kind of cross-border observatory, a platform for constructing an elastic civic identity, a kind of cross-border res publica. With our partners, we curate unwalling experiments you know, that dissolve the wall using visual tools like diagrams and radical cartographies to situate border neighborhoods within broader spatial ecologies of circulation and interdependence from local to regional 
to continental and ultimately to global scales. We see elasticity as a civic skill, the ability to stretch and return over and again between local and more expansive ways of thinking, to understand one's challenges within broader dynamics and processes, and really to envision opportunities for solidarity and collective action across walls. Here at the border, the idea of the bioregion, Teddy introduced you before, the binational watershed system has been a powerful imaginary for activating a more elastic civic identity in our region. Several years ago, we curated a cross-border public action through one of the sewage drains that Homeland Security had carved into the wall between the Loreles Canyon and the Tijuana River Estuary that Teddy introduced you to. We negotiated a permit with US Homeland Security to transform the drain into an official port of entry for 24 hours. They agreed, they were disarmed by our self-representation as just artists. As long as Mexican immigration officials were waiting on the south end of the, south end of the drain to stamp our passports. Our convoy was comprised of 300 local activists, residents, representatives from both municipalities and artists and border activists from around the world. We summoned agencies that are typically at odds with one another. And as we moved together southbound under the wall, we witnessed slum wastewater flowing northbound toward the estuary beneath our feet. This strange crossing from estuary to slum through a militarized culvert and the stamping of passports inside this liminal space amplified the most profound contradictions and interdependencies of our region. The great insight is that protecting the vulnerable US estuary requires shared investment in the informal Mexican settlement. So in this experiment, we went down, but sometimes nurturing civic elasticity requires ascending above the familiar. You know, in the early 20th century, we don't need to tell you, Patrick Geddes designed the Camera Obscura in the center of Edinburgh, you know, sort of five-story observation tower that enabled people to look out across the territory to comprehend the environmental systems that comprise it. He coined the term regionalism. For Geddes, this ascending was essential to constructing a civic identity and a collective political will. Now imagine a Mexican child standing right here, right here on a narrow sliver of land at the Eastern rim of Loreles Canyon, hundreds of feet above the border wall, right here at a place called Mirador. Imagine she plants her feet facing due west with the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean in front of her, Mexico to her left, the US to her right. Below to her immediate left, she sees the dense informal settlement where she lives. She can spot her house and her school and experience a proximity to a country that she and her family are not permitted to, to enter. Below to her immediate right, almost directly beneath her feet, she sees the border wall, which from this vantage appears like a flimsy and ridiculous strip inserted onto a vast and powerful natural system. Lifting her eyes a bit, she sees the vulnerable wetlands of the Tijuana River estuary with its sediment basins contrived to catch northbound flows of trash from her community. And further beyond still, you can't see it in this photo, downtown San Diego rising vertically into the sky. From this vantage, all of the characters of this contested zone come to life. We've witnessed this moment of recognition again and again over the years among children, our students, policymakers, even foundation presidents. There are few places on earth, we've argued, where, the, where one can witness the collision of informality, militarization, environmental vulnerability, and the proximity of wealth and poverty so vividly. But in reality, the conflicts that we experience here locally between nation and nature are reproduced again and again along the entire trajectory of the continental border between the US and Mexico. Over the years, we've collected aerial photos that document precise points where the jurisdictional line collides with natural systems, powerfully illustrating what dumb sovereignty looks like when it hits the ground in a complex bioregion. 
In our Mexus project, we stretch civic elasticity to a continental scale. Mexus visualizes the entire continental border without the line. It dissolves the border into a bioregion whose shape is defined by the eight binational watershed systems that are bisected by the international border. Mexus also exposes other systems and flows across this bioregional territory. Tribal nations, protected lands, croplands, urban crossings, many more informal ones, 15 million people and more. Ultimately, Mexus counters America's wall building fantasies with more expansive imaginaries of belonging and cooperation beyond the nation state. Here it is in 2018 at the Venice Architecture Biennale. This work has really helped to provoke dialogue about a shared bioregional civic identity among Mexicans, Americans, and diverse tribal nations who inhabit this region. Now the final civic space, literally, is a visualization project called the Political Equator, which traces an imaginary line from San Diego, Tijuana, across the planet, forming a corridor of global conflict between the 30th and 38th parallels north. Along its trajectory lie some of the world's most contested and violent thresholds. The US-Mexico border at San Diego, Tijuana, the most trafficked international border in the Western hemisphere, the Strait of Gibraltar in the Mediterranean, the main route from North Africa into fortress Europe, the Israeli-Palestinian border that divides the Middle East, emblematized by Israel's 50-year military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, India, Kashmir, a site of intense and enduring territorial conflict between Pakistan and India since partition, the border between North and South Korea, representing decades of Cold War conflict, and China's accelerating militarization of the South China Sea, along with Taiwan and Hong Kong. Now, visualizing the political equator here in red, alongside the climatic equator, below in green was an astonishing discovery for us because the ribbon in between them, give or take a few degrees, contains our planet's most populous slums, its sites of greatest natural resource extraction and export, and its zones of greatest political instability, climate vulnerability, and human displacement. And when these parallel lines are applied above the, you know, the Pierce Quincuncial projection, the Arctic becomes protagonist with its melting ice caps detonating hemispheric conflict through sea level rise, dramatic coastal vulnerability and human displacement. This collision of nationalism and border building, climate catastrophe and forced migration is the global injustice trifecta of our time. But as we said at the beginning, these dynamics always hit the ground somewhere and are experienced by people locally in everyday places like ours and yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.